Coming to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. We're going to teach you about the art of executive producer. That comes from a hit songwriter. Plus, we have a very special guest. We'll introduce him to you in a second. Um, we've got the grand prize winner of the Pensado Auto-Tune giveaway. Uh, but we're going to hold off for a little bit before we announce it. Mm -hmm. Grab your calendars. We want you to mark something. We've got a very special Pensado's Place Live at NAM coming up in January. Can you believe we're here already? No. We are going to have a powerhouse panel with an incredible lineup. We're not gonna tell you today who it is, but here's where you mark your calendars. Friday, January 17th in the Hilton Hotel Ballroom. We're gonna have a meetup afterwards and it's going to be a blast. You're gonna meet a serious set of superstars. Details coming up soon. Also for our good friends at Sweetwater, you know the bus. Uh, they're giving you a chance to win your wish list. Very simple. Visit Sweetwater.com, create a wish list of whatever you want, and you'll be automatically entered to win $5,000 worth of gear that you pick out. $5,000 of gear that you pick out. Again, all you have to do is build out your wish list, submit it with anything they have in their incredible inventory before November 24th, and you are automatically entered to win. And because of all this juicy information, you know what you want to do? You want to sign up for our newsletter. So do that, like, subscribe, and click notify if you would, and we would really appreciate it. Now it's time to announce the grand prize winner in this Pensado Auto-Tune giveaway. You guys have been great, been sending in your emails. A lot of folks have won Auto-Tune EFX, but now it's the big one. And to show you how much this company cares, they sent down their chief marketing officer, the one, the only Dave Prisgoda. We want to introduce you, but better known as Pris. Pris, Pris good goes to up. see you, bro. Good to see you. I'll give you, I'll give you money across the table. Yeah. So you want to announce the, the grand prize winner? Sure. So, um, yeah, we're really excited. Um, Daniel Silverman. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. So Daniel wins the Auto-Tune Vocal Studio. Um, it's got the Avox suite of plugins, yep. right? And Auto-Tune Pro. And awesome. Auto-Tune yep. Pro is, is part of it. Now, you pretty much can, there's, that's a tool that you can pretty much get anything done with. There vocals, you go. Correct? Yep. Mic modeling, all that stuff. All that but, stuff. Yep. Well, we want to talk about a few of those things. So, But before we do, just want to thank everybody who entered. Thank Antares for, for what they've done. A whole bunch of you guys entered, a number of winners. The the auto tunes. One of the things that we noticed, and in, in when we started discussing this, the company philosophy is really artists for artists, musicians for musicians. Right? Tell yep. us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I mean, you know, we're we're still a small company. You know, we're about fifteen people, mm -hmm. but um, you know, we're made up of Berkeley grads and luthiers and jazz bassists, and um, you know, we're we're musicians ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think when we design tools and, and everything we're doing, um, it's kind of grounded in that mission to, you know, what do musicians need? What do people, artists and music makers need to so do So do you hear job? back from the community and then you try to solve the problems that you hear about? Is that Absolutely. So we, we have a great dialogue with, with obviously our customers. Mm -hmm. I think that direct communication, I mean, there's different, obviously, groups of customers from the pro, pro folks to the guys making or gals making music in their, their studio at home. Mm -hmm. um, but we try and have a, a constant dialogue and certainly... Um, staying connected to, you know, the, the folks on the front lines of, of the top charting hits and make sure we have a sense of what, musically and culturally where where everything's headed. I know you speak the truth because we now have access to uh, Autotune Classic. Yeah. When we had Jess Jackson on and Mike Dean and so on and so forth, and Dave, you and I have talked mm -hmm. about the the features are so rich in Autotune EFX+. Plus. Like, what's your favorite feature in it? Uh, easily the Mike Dean presets. Mike Dean scores yeah, again. Yeah. yeah. A lot of times I'll take uh, a version, one of the one of the several versions, and and I'll split a stereo into into a left and right. And on the left, I'll put the parameters a certain way, and on the right, I'll use a different set of parameters. And when you put on earbuds or even even straight through a pair of speakers, it gives it just this 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 three D space. And so that's what I try to do on backgrounds, for example, or or synthesizers that I want to sit behind the singer in the mix. So, yeah, I think if you use your imagination, you can find so much more for these plugins than just tuning, you know? But what's the most unusual usage you've heard for, for the oh, product? Oh, man, I mean, the, the you go on the social media, there's no shortage of uh, use cases. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend who basically used our suite of plugins to 
create some really scary effects. Use the FX Plus to make, you know, record all these tracks, make it sound like a monster, make himself. And he's trying to scare kids in the neighborhood Uh um, using our effects. But um, anything that's vocal processing, uh, I like to think our technology is right at the heart of that. So movie business, streaming business, television business. Gaming, which is one of the the fastest growing genre of entertainment right now. Um, So I think there's a lot of applications there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fun to do this. It's always good to get a friendship out of doing business. And, uh, you know, we love what you're doing. And and hopefully the contest was good for you guys. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, first of all, I'm honored to be be here. I've been watching your guys, you know, show for 10 years since I had my first Logic set up in my parents' basement. (laughs) That's Um, great. But yeah, you 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 guys have been a a pleasure. You know, shout out to Talisha, who's been great help as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But we, we really enjoyed working with you guys, so thank you. Great. Good stuff. Always good to have partners that care about the community. Absolutely. and Use their uh, stuff every day. Congrats to Antares and what they're doing. And now to our guest. Uh, there's an art form called executive producing, and we thought we would talk about it with a Grammy-nominated producer and songwriter. Please enjoy our conversation with Jen DeSilvio. Your uh, interesting background, be- yeah. besides the songwriting and the producing and the piano playing, the beginning was a Jersey girl who worked in finance and was an athlete, correct? That's correct. Tell us how we got from that to your to what I assume was a passion laying in the, in there somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. In there. And the yeah. talent. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I uh, went to school for finance at Lehigh mm-hmm. in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, played soccer. Got my degree. Went to go work uh, at Deloitte. Uh Two and a half years doing wow. post deal valuation, mm-hmm. discounted cash flow models. Fun stuff. Um, and was reading Deepak Chopra, wondering why I was doing what I was doing. And uh, basically was depressed. So I quit um, and went to go work <clears throat> at a studio in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And then I made the move to LA and basically bothered everyone and their mother to work with me, but only one person did. And that was my friend Honey, who was signed to Macy Gray. Mm-hmm. And we wrote songs together for like a whole summer. And I taught myself logic. And that was basically the so how self, I got here. Self taught along all the way, correct? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Either collaborating with people or learning yourself, just driven by your own interest and passion. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, you know, guests. We've had a number of guests who've done it that way, and some could say we did it that way in certain parts of it. Yeah, but, I do say I did it that way. But, but that often gets you closer in touch to your creativity because you're yeah. constantly in there as opposed to having to have somebody else give you information that you have to sort through and see if it fits you or not. You're your own repository, right? Yeah. And, and you're digging in all the time. When did you get from, okay, I'm writing songs, I'm doing stuff, to I'm now working on things? Wow, that's a great question. Because sometimes, like this morning, I woke up and I was like, "Am I doing anything with my life?" Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's like, yeah, but you know, it's like a constant. I think we all, as creatives, wonder: Are we apply for a different job every damn day? Yeah, like maybe I should quit and go work in finance again. Maybe Mm -hmm. no, don't do that. Um, I think it was when this guy named Zach Katz uh, ran Um, at the time. He was managing mm -hmm. Jr. Mm -hmm. Wrote him. Mm -hmm. And Zach was like, we should do a publishing deal. And I said, publishing is the devil. No, you're taking all of my rights. <laughs> um, and he's like, you're insane. And I said, whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then he went over to BMG and um, he said, come on, let's try it. And then I did a deal. And that's when, through BMG is how I met Andra, mm-hmm. uh, through this guy uh, named Andrew Gould, mm-hmm. who was working there at the time. Mm-hmm. And he connected me and Andra. He's like, I have this new artist. She's really great. And that's Andra. She's amazing. She's a light. Mm-hmm. It's truly a spirit, mm-hmm. um, an angel. And uh, he was like, you got to meet this girl, Andra. And uh, I met her and we wrote uh, three songs, one of which was Rise Up and the other two, uh, The World Hasn't Heard and probably never will. <laughs> and you, in in that collaboration, like with Rise Up, you co-wrote that and co-produced it? Yes. Got it. Got so it. the way that happened, um, there's actually a section of the song that isn't in the final recording. There's a pre-chorus mm-hmm. that we cut out. But um, Andra came to, at the time I had a home studio, mm-hmm. which was a bedroom, converted into a studio, which was... There's a whole lot of bedroom yeah, studios bedroom, out there. Bedroom 
Huh? This is a good time to ask you some questions about. about well, well let her answer the the question I asked her. <laughs> oh no! Which is how did that come about? <laughs> the co-production. I'll and, forget. Uh, <laughs> stop talking. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no, no. Go ahead. No, go ahead. no, I'll stop everybody. So, how did the co-production come about and co-write on Rise Up? Um. So, Andrew came to my house. Um. We. She came in. She was wearing sweats, and ironically, I had just gotten a puppy. And my partner said, you're never around. You need to bring the dog back. So <laughs> I brought the dog back after I had it for 24 hours. And by the way, in my mind, I had trained it. It loved me. We were talking. Like, it was perfect. <laughs> after a day? <laughs> I think it was listening to me. Mm-hmm. And I was a puppy, but I have, I'm a dog whisperer, and I thought, it was, I thought it was perfect. Anyway, brought the dog back. I was hysterical. Mm-hmm. And normally when I'm working with an artist, it's about them. Mm-hmm. Always. It's always about the artist. And Andrew came over and I just started crying. I started crying because of the dog. And um, she was like, what's wrong with you? Like, And I told her a story. And then we went in the, the back, then went to the studio. And um, we wrote two songs. Uh, one, which I think is called Favor. And then the other one was just me playing these four chords and her singing melodies, um, and the only lyrics that came out were Rise Up on the chorus. Rise up. Mm -hmm. Ah." And then she's like, all right, got to go, bye. And she left. And um, a couple months later, I was going through just some songs I had done, and I I listened to it, and I said, huh, this is pretty good. So I sent it to her Mm -hmm. and her manager, and I said, hey, guys, I think there's something in this. And her manager wrote back and said, oh, yeah, definitely. And... uh, Fast forward to, I went to the label. I played it for Fenster at the time, who mm-hmm. was her A&R. Amazing. Jeff, know, yeah, you know yeah. Jeff. And uh, he called Dan McCarroll straight away and was like, we have a song. And he said, Jen, you need to finish the lyrics ASAP. Mm-hmm. So Andra and I got back together. We finished the lyrics. We cut out the pre. The song that you hear is is pretty much the demo that existed initially. But then Adrian Gervitz, who I co-produced the song with, I sent him all the parts. Mm -hmm. He redid the vocals. The background arrangements that are in there were the original ones that Andrew and I did Mm. at my studio. Mm -hmm. And then they um, redid parts and kept parts. And that's basically how it happened. And turned into what it is, which is super amazing. Were you there for when she did the vocal? No. Mm -mm. Because it is one otherworldly, you know, spiritual kind of thing. See, but that's the thing about that song that's amazing. It's the, I think it's, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's a great song, Mm -hmm. but I think the reason it, it it reacted the way it did is because of the authenticity and the richness of her vocal. No question. Mm -hmm. No question. Herb used the word spiritual. And and, uh, I was thinking the same thing when I was listening to several of your songs back to back. It felt like, it felt like you, especially, um, um, that song, it, it ends with kind of like a, a pseudo gospel choir. It seems like you have a, a, a bit of a gospel tension in a lot of your songs. They're, they're like big and theatrical and dramatic and. Like my personality, pretty much. <laughs> yes, I was thinking that. Um, and then, and then the, the vocal performances are always great because, because what you provide for them to sing over must be fun and to hear that in their headphones and start singing, you know? But but you're theatrical and and kind of dramatic, really, like 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 a like early queen, you know that kind of oh, stuff. Thank well, mid, you. Mid 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 queen. But uh, is that something you try to do, or does it come come naturally? I kind of just follow the feeling, you know. If a oh. song calls for um, extreme, you know, vocal production and yeah. massive choral effects. The Ben oh. Weaver song. Uh, the, uh, there's one that's just like that, like no drums and just. Uh, sail on. Yeah, that one too. There's several in your repertoire, uh, and I think there's a place for that in the world today. You know, I hope. Well, I mean, it, it feels like we need that type of catharsis. You know. Well, let me ask this question because I think when you talked about Rise Up and that you guys' background vocals were on there, and you just did a little bit of the melody, is there a singer sitting in there? In, in me? Yeah. Not a good one. No. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think a bad one either. I mean, because I, I, what I just heard. And when I think about the fact that your vocals will work. As you sing on those backs, the backgrounds, mm-hmm. they're great. I mean, yeah, but Andra, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're not we're not necessarily comparing apples to apples. Like, she's some other kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But in order for you to write, and do you write from piano? Is that where you work Mostly. on? Mostly. And melody is a big part of what you? 
Mm-hmm. So there's there's a voice in your head that is following totally. something. Yeah. I mean, it's actually interesting because, you know, I was telling you guys before that I, I'm a songwriter first. Mm-hmm. And basically, that was my job always to, you know, if you're quote unquote a top liner, which by the way, I don't really like that word. I think it's just because I'm you're with you actually. You don't like top line? Either. Well, what a, it's kind of insignificant. I'm on top. I'm 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 a top liner. Like what's what else is between it? <laughs> no? Okay. Well uh, it's a different tip your waitress, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just think is there's more to than just doing the line on top. Is yeah. It, it, what do you refer to it as? That's the problem. It's hard songwriter. Yeah. Might be a start. <laughs> or lyricist, maybe. Melodic lyric lyrical genius. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think every part is really important. I think the production is is essential. But at the end of the day, if we don't have something to sing along to, it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, the that was kind of my a lot of the original. I actually sing on some Galantis songs, which I wish I didn't, but. They're great. I just don't like my voice, which is why I was never Most an artist. Most singers don't. I mean, some big singers I've worked with, I can't solo when they're in the room. I can't solo their vocals because then I'll be there for two weeks. That doesn't Rip- sound good? Well, no, they think it doesn't sound good. They don't. Almost all singers don't like their voice oh. that I've worked with. So you're in good company. I guess yeah. so. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, don't, I don't like my voice when I hear it when, when, when I watch the show. Really? Back, yeah. I mean... I sound ignorant. <laughs> I got good test scores. I can prove it. But I just don't like the way I sound. And I think it's normal. I'm sitting at a table of raging insecurity. <laughs> Combined with complete and encapsulating arrogance. Uh, well, on one side of the table. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when did piano like start in your like life? Because obviously that's an important uh, component in your toolkit. Eighth grade. Gotcha. Which would be 13. Gotcha. So do you... Is it a place where you can escape? When you're in, we're in a piano, that's a place where Jen can just go inside, find your own yeah. muse and do your thing. Yeah. yeah, and that was what I did for years until I started bringing artists, other writers, other producers mm-hmm. into my my brain. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still, like when, I don't know, like whatever, I mean, I know you, you don't play instruments, right? Yeah, you, Oh, you do? Okay, mm-hmm. so you know what it's like. Mm-hmm. When you're just like, I need five minutes, and then you can just all of a sudden turns into an hour. You're mm-hmm. like, what have I been doing? Mm-hmm. And it's cathartic. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I play like, I don't know, moody chords are kind of my favorite. Yeah, I was going to ask you what you thought your songwriting style. Do, do you conform to the artists that you're working with and find that collaborative space? Is there a Jen to Sylvia style? I put my lens on the artist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think... If I were to make my own music, it would be aggressive and weird. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. Natasha, for instance, like she, the record, uh, Spat for Lashes, she's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, We, you know, she has made a lot of albums. She's she's a producer and a songwriter as well. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to go for like this 80s synth feel. And I was like, are you sure we could make this like Kate Bush, like ethereal Mm -hmm. record? Mm -hmm. And and she said, no, I want to. I want to go to 80s. Mm. And so that's what we did. A lot of Lynn sounds, Lynn mm-hmm. drums, mm-hmm. a lot of toms. Mm-hmm. Um, I love loops, and she made me program every single part, which mm. was... That was an interesting exercise. Yeah, it was. And also, it made me realize that I'm not... Look, there's nothing wrong with Splice. I think it's great as a first starter. Mm-hmm. But I think... I was going to say this earlier, but mm-hmm. for me, where you pull your sounds from, where you get them... It's kind of like, you want barilla pasta or do you want fresh? Mm-hmm. And I feel like when you get fresh pasta, it tastes better. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's the water mm-hmm. and it's the salt. And where's the water mm-hmm. from? And it's tomatoes from the bark mm-hmm. garden in the mm-hmm. back. Or are they genetically modified by Monsanto in the fields? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and Natasha was like, you need to program these drums individually. Mm-hmm. Stop mm-hmm. She wanted really. good pasta. She wanted fresh <laughs> pasta. You know, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, because... Uh, the high likelihood I am. I love loops, and the reason I like loops is, let's say you're doing a beat, and you do the beat from scratch. You've got to sit there and decide, is this good or is this bad? And and because you did it, sometimes it's hard to do that. But when you select a loop you love, you're starting from a foundation of, of something you love. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to guess whether you like it or not. But when you sit there and you and you program a beat, you you always have to evaluate it based on 
whatever it is you use to evaluate. And it's much harder to evaluate if that's good or not than a loop. Which so, is already so, so, made, yeah. Yeah, so, so maybe start with a loop and change everything. Because at least, yeah. you know, at one time you liked it, you know? Yeah, I think... I Am think, I wrong? I don't know. No, I think every, every whatever, different strokes for different folks, mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, you can make anything work, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I think the authentic, ah, I use this word a lot, but like where the sound, it could be a, a Casio loop and it could be the fullest mm-hmm. Casio loop ever. And it mm-hmm. could also be some Basker drums that are just like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It really just depends on like what the song needs. And sometimes if the song isn't written yet and mm-hmm. you're just putting it in to inspire yeah. the writing. Yeah, that's, that's a different point, a different process when you already have a song semi-written, right. yeah. I think whatever works, really. You, you mentioned movie chords. Um, that that kind of caught my ear. A movie chord would be like, like the old-timey movies were orchestrations and they had yeah. big orchestras and those chords were like, like not regular chords uh, is that what you're kind of talking about that bigger than life it totally enhanced with like i think it's just more like a lot of sevenths <laughs> <laughs> yeah just yeah enhanced chords okay yeah. i was wondering because i never thought about that but that's true isn't it i guess i mean sometimes though but even though like rise up is four chords mm-hmm. it's so simple mm-hmm. i think it's i mean i don't i think it's in the key of a but I'm going to do C because that's where my brain is. It goes C minor, C major, G major, A minor, F mm-hmm. over and over and over and over again. And well, we, we preach a lot and given as much time as we've been in the business that a lot of genius is about how to get to simplicity. Right. It's not necessarily genius Boy, to be so complex. True. It's, that's it's true. so hard to get to that kind of simplicity stuff. And we have discussions when we go out and talk, we talk about to, to audiences and particularly millennials or younger that pop means popularity. It doesn't mean selling out. Totally. It means doing something that's so simple that a lot of people go, oh my God, this is like incredible. And you're actually touching people with that simplicity. And that's hard to get to. And those who can do it really consistently, I mean, what made the Beatles the Beatles? Yeah. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard yeah, to mixing yeah, yeah. too, to be, to be simple. Well, I was going to say, I was really, the question I was getting to in a long way is when you put on your different hats, and to me, in researching you and talking to our good friend Lindsay, shout out to Lindsay for the turn on. Lindsay. Right? We love Lindsay at Apple now. Um, there's the songwriter, Jen, mm-hmm. and then there's the producer, Jen, and you do some EP work, mm-hmm. which means that, and I want you to explain what EP means to, to our audience. That means somebody's entrusting you with an overall vision of bringing something from beginning to the end, correct? Mm -hmm. Does that define what an EP is? And then how does that play into your creative process? Executive producer. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's understanding, it's like what you said, understanding where artist wants to go Mm -hmm. and then making sure that they can get there with whatever tools are needed to get there. Within the budget. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's what a lot of people understand. I mean, I've EP'd a, a million records and that's somebody with... With a budget, generally a label, but it could be an independent, trusting you to get with their artist and the process to get from beginning to end, fiscally and creatively in a way that they can put something else that wins inside a timeline. Exactly. Like it's the business, it combines a bus- a left-right brain kind of process. Yeah. Right? So when you're in the middle of that and you're a songwriter and producing and EPing. It's a lot. It makes you crazy, right? Well, I feel like for me... As an executive producer, and I don't know why I feel this way, but <clears throat> it's kind of like having like a bird's eye macro view of the Absolutely. whole situation. And there are a lot of, there are songs that I don't produce or write mm-hmm. that go on the album. Absolutely, It's just picking and choosing. Like for instance, let's say that I'm just producing the record and mm-hmm. I haven't written anything. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll pick songs. The artists will share songs. When I did the Beth Ditto record, we wrote, I think there were 12 songs on the album and I wrote 10 of them with her, Mm -hmm. but the other two she had written um, with other people. And one of them I was, you know, adamant about putting on the album because it was exceptional. And Mm -hmm. the other one I said, are you, what the hell's wrong with you? This does not fit anything that we did. Mm -hmm. And she's like, and she taught me a really great lesson. And she said, "Um, Jen, uh, it's not your record. You don't choose. And I was like, <laughs> Bingo. I was like, okay, okay, you're not the artist. 
you don't make the decision. And mm. even as I didn't executive produce that, but I don't really I wouldn't. It's just a title, really. I think um, when you're producing the whole record, it doesn't really matter. I think mm -hmm. EPing is important when there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, mm -hmm. or an artist doesn't know where they want to go. And in that particular case, sometimes you're EPing your own product. That yeah, that's true. You know, that's like oh, I have to choose and decide about my own song and does it fit or not? Because yeah. some artists do give that license to people they trust and say, help totally. me shape it and help me sequence. And there's others who say, stay away. It's it's my process. It's, it's different per, per uh, artist, right? Totally. And I think with artists who are really strong with what they create independently mm -hmm. of anyone, mm -hmm. um, they are less inclined to need a, more help. Completely. I think ones that have a lot of people um, like label executives and A&Rs who are contributing to the creative process. Mm -hmm. I find that being an EP is helpful, especially if those artists don't want to talk to the A&Rs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of, can, I can be a bridge because I can help each get to where they need to Very go. Good. Yeah. My favorite song of yours is uh, Ciao, Adios. Oh, you love that yeah, song. Yeah, um, Shower the horse, I'm done, Herb. I, I don't even want to go into what that lyric could mean in regards to you. Okay. When, <laughs> it could mean a lot of things. When you, uh, a lot of things. When, you, uh, when you finish this, go play the song, and I swear to you it sounds like in the end she's saying, shower the horse, I'm done. In fact, you use that as part of your uh, promotion for the song. And uh, <laughs> and uh, the thing I like about that song is, first of all, it's dance hall, and I love dance hall. And secondarily, you took a subject that that, that that's... That, that could be considered slightly hackneyed and, and, and you took it to a whole nother level on a dance hall beat with everybody thinking you're saying, shower the horse, I'm done. <laughs> it's my favorite song. I love it. Explain how, how, it, what I'm talking about to the audience. So that actually was a huge shower the horse, I'm done. It was a huge thing in England and people say it now and not even the song name. Instead mm. of ciao adios, I'm done. Mm. Ciao adios, I'm done. Mm. Shower the horse, I'm mm. done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she says it. She doesn't, say, she doesn't say adios. She says. Ciao adios. Shower the horse. I'm, yeah. <laughs> she puts a duh instead of a uh. <laughs> It, All right, it's I'll, wonderful. I'll, but, I'll ask her why she did it. That. It's know. like Old Town Road when they kicked it <laughs> off of off of the country chart. It went it went through the roof. People thinking that probably helped people get exposed to it because it's a great song. I'm gonna start using and Maria's whew. showers and horses and animals in Absolutely. all my lyrics Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Remember. Um, <laughs> uh, big girls don't cry. Mm -hmm. I always thought that was a big girl's small price mm. when I, when I was like 12 years old, I swear I did. Mm. And then, and then some people, uh, did you Hendrix, act upon that? Hendrix, excuse me while I kissed the sky. We thought he was saying, excuse me while I kissed this guy. Oh, wow. Wow. There's been a bunch of those, but this was great. What's fascinating is that you became a mixer with such bad ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> such a successful mixer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, speaking of that, do you get involved in mix in picking the mix engineer that does your work? Yeah, yeah, for the it, most part. Yeah, because it's um, not an area that you want to do, but it's, it's it's a critical space, correct? Mm -hmm. I don't like to mix. I don't like to master, and mm -hmm. I have friends that are do those jobs really well. And I work on songs too long, and I need mm -hmm. a need fresh. A break. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you use the same mixer, or do you use different mixers for different things? Different for different. Got it. Um, and picking them. Sometimes I don't know what to do, and it's a discussion, too, if I'm mm -hmm. not really fully aware. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the times, I don't want it touched, and, you know, the... Mm -hmm. the yeah. Sorry Ooh. about that. I have mosquitoes that's like our, me. That's our mixed fly. <laughs> that's your mixed fly? Yeah. It's coming back. No, he's, he comes, he's put, comes to set every Tuesday. Uh -huh. um, um, no, uh, I didn't produce Chow Adios. I just wrote it. Mm -hmm. Um, but we did, we, Anne Marie and I, a lot of the, a, a lot of those lyrics, by the way, came from, oh, sorry, I'm pulling on the cord. Sorry. Um, it just kind of came out really quickly. Like there was a, there was a beat the producer was playing. Sorry, I'll get back to the mix question in a second. But, um, um, uh, the producer was playing this beat and I literally heard that it literally, I, it, I could find it in my phone. It was, then I once tell you twice now, then I lend in my collar. And Amory was like, oh, that's really cool. I'm like, is it? And I think, I think it fucking sucks, but mm -hmm, whatever, mm -hmm. sure, let's run with it. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, it's done. Mm. It's done. Some things come that way. And she was sitting on the couch and I was sitting next to her. And I, and I speak Italian, not fluently, but mm -hmm. I can take you guys around, show you a good time. Gotcha. gotcha. And call for help if we need it. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, um, and 
she, I said, oh, ciao, ciao. And she goes, adios. She goes, ciao, adios, I'm done. And I, and I said, yeah, I think. Because, <laughs> you know, it's like it walks that line. It's like, you know, to be mm-hmm. a great pop song, I think it, they all walk that line of being yeah. cringe mm-hmm. and too yeah. self-involved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, she, you know, we, we left and that was that. And then we wrote another song on the way home to a beat I had made which is on her record called Cry, which is a yeah, sick that's, song. Yeah, that's just that's, the mm. two of us, which is cool to have only two people on a pop song, by the way, which mm-hmm. is rare these days. It's very rare these days. Um, but the mixer, I think t- Tom Meredith and MDL produced um, Ciao Adios. Mm. And I love the dance hall beat. Me and the too. guitars, it Me hits too. hard, mm-hmm. it's perfect. Mm-hmm. And I think Phil Tam mixed it. Oh, Phil's, Phil. Phil. It sounds so Atlanta Phil. Yeah. I've mm-hmm. never met him. I've just been on emails. Yeah, he lives in Orlando now. He's um, that right? yeah, he's mm-hmm. um, that tax free life. One of the best. One of the best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he is. Uh-huh. Sorry, never mind. When did you him. when did you notice the facility for either labels or managers or publishers or whatever to put an artist in your hands and say, "Help us bring it home," because that that's not something that's given up easily. I don't know, honestly. I think. Was it from the beginning? Did it happen after you had some success? Was it just a question of relationships? Because given your background, there's also obviously a facility for business because in the finance side. And a lot of times, creative people don't know that's coming through in discussion with executives. Like, oh, this person Mm -hmm. can see the big picture. This person has a macro picture. I've been in that position Mm -hmm. all my career. Mm -hmm. Um, I can tell. Well, it's, it's a great license to have somebody say, bring us home. You know, here's the, but in your particular case, unlike mine, you also may be the producer and you may be the songwriter or yeah. whatever. So it's a, it's, it's a trust thing. <clears throat> I think that's it. I think exactly it's trust. And mm-hmm. I think when, if an artist trusts you and the manager or the A&R or mm-hmm. whoever, mm-hmm. if they see that and you're having either A, success or results, mm-hmm. I think that's when it starts to happen. And I think mm-hmm. Anne-Marie was probably the first artist where, um, I was involved across the whole um, album mm-hmm. um, as her friend, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and then also like a, a core collaborator. Because mm-hmm. you have you have a a wide range of artists you're involved with, both yeah. as a producer and a songwriter, <laughs> wide range of genres and so so forth. Yeah, and part of what goes on is the the behind chatter is good. Mm-hmm. Because a publisher is talking to a manager and a manager is talking to an a and r person, and they're all saying, "Yeah, you know she makes sense and so and so forth and that that comes from you being able to be counted on and delivering and trusting in yeah. conversations because none of that happens without that other conversation. you know it wouldn't happen if everybody's going she sucks don't mm-hmm. don't talk to her they're not oh. gonna you know, so we're all a little bit... Maybe people think I suck I'm sure some do so. oh well, listen, you wouldn't be good at this if people didn't and, and so being good at that also, what a lot of people don't know is that the athletic soccer playing oh Jen to Sylvia is about to be tested athletically on batter's box. Oh, no. Yeah. So um, even though you blew out your knee ages oh ago, <laughs> but that was a time that inspired great stuff. Years ago, so. so between blown out knees, blown out brains, this should be just a fest. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. let's go with batter's box. All righty. Lyrics. Vital. Piano. Sometimes. Song key. Whatever fits the artist. Harmonies. Sometimes. Melody. Vital. Good answer. Guitars. Um, Great for my brain. Uh, AP, the extended play meaning. Uh, It's a decision. Streaming. In your face. <laughs> Inspiration. Through the air. So what's your favorite reviewer? The SP 2016. Oh, what do you use for by your time? Logic. It's just quick and it's up there, but. There's some great presets on the 2016 if you look, look for them. If your studio caught fire, what one piece of gear besides a hard drive or, some, or a computer, what would you rescue? That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> da, 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 da. My profit. Yeah, but you want to know what? I don't love it that much. <laughs> like, I wouldn't, like, I'd probably, like, see who was in the studio first and help get them out or... I think you'd take your puppy. 
Um, puppy's not, I think Puppy's in North Carolina somewhere, oh, living gone. its best life. <laughs> and by the way, thank you for the shout out. Uh, Lindsay told us that she had you at an event and mm -hmm. you gave a Pensado's Place shout out. And we want to thank you for that. Absolutely. And, and, and look, the good part about what's fun about you is that you take your bundle of creativity and neuroses and all that kind of stuff and you make it work. And yeah, I, man. And I, I think to. that is incredibly freeing and part of the part of the artistic process. So it's it's really cool. Do you uh, when you're recording vocals, do you record them yourself? As yeah. What what's your what's your vocal chain? Neve 1073 LA 2A and then Manly or SM7. What do you listen to? What do you monitor with? Uh, ATCs. So you have your own room now, and that's yeah. that's where you work. Twenty fives. Yep. Cool. Yep. I have a 6176, which I use for acoustic guitars um, with the Telefunken condenser. That's a newer mic, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. I have uh, Royer Ribbons on my piano, I which goes Royer. straight into the 8P. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to kind of upgrade a bit and get a couple, couple more vintage pieces, yeah. like compressors and uh, preamps and stuff. A lot of my friends... Uh, yell at me for being in the box, but uh, whatever. Well, it's a sacrament, whatever just, works. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like if you use great mics <laughs> to great gear mm -hmm. on great instruments and you have a great player, should be okay. Should be good. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I think, think so that's too. a pretty good rule to go by. The, the quality of, in general of most things in the in in our world is really, really high this, these days. Mm -hmm. In the early 90s, it was hit or miss. You know, you... you Cheap meant really cheap. Now, less expensive is still pretty doggone good. What do you mean by less expensive? Like like instead of a $5,000 mic, uh, oh. an $800 mic, right? I, I've had good good vocals come to me out of a $200 USB mic that I made work. It, it, it's a different world. And then and then plug-in versus analog, that, that debate died five years ago. People, people that talk still talk about it, that they, they just have more to do than... Than time <laughs> that we we don't have to, you know. And and uh, um, speaking of Macy Gray, I did a record with her, and, and I did I used it all in the box, and I'd play it for people, engineers. As uh, I went to another studio and did analog, I'm like, oh, see, you need to go back to analog. And I'm like, it never saw analog, it never saw analog ever until the wow. it comes out of a pair of speakers. But it's a new world, yeah. and I think it's a great world because Herb Herb calls it the space is flattening out. It, the entry level now is everyone. And when Herb and I were coming along, you couldn't get into a studio that was good. It was you'd have to pay two hundred or you know two grand a day just for a studio. And now you can you can do what any engineer on earth can do with just five six hundred dollars worth of equipment. Yeah, people are people are obsessing over nuance now. Yeah, it's by degrees. You know. Yeah. And, well, and I, and I that, think it's taking yeah. creative people off the path sometimes because they get yeah. caught down in the weeds. Yeah. And so you stop evaluating good versus great. And this is better by 3%. And then I got to go for this 6%. Mm -hmm. And you're chasing perfection sometimes, your version of perfection, as opposed to something that touches the soul. Right. And, and when people miss the touching of the soul, they miss the whole bananas. A, yeah. A piece of crap that sounds perfect. It's still just a piece, piece of, of crap. crap. Yep, yep. And stuff you do is not that. That's what's so great. Thank about you. That. And, uh, I appreciate that. Again, I we like thank our good friend Lindsay for turning us on to you. We are uh, glad you're a fan. Hope you had a good time. You uh, had an all right time. You'd, okay, well, no, it was great. <laughs> it was good. Uh, really appreciate your talents and what you're doing. And um, we're going to have you back on too. Don't be afraid to come back and visit. Promise. Yeah. Cool. Dave, take us home. Uh, to extend what what we were just talking about, um, sometimes it's better to be in, incredibly familiar with one piece of gear than to be slightly familiar with a hundred pieces of gear. I remember when I only had one or two pieces of gear, I knew those things inside and out, and I could get them to do things that other people didn't know how to do because mother's the necessity of in, uh, invention. And so don't 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 be envious if you don't have the newest greatest piece of gear everybody on the internet is talking about. Master what you've got and then grow into what you need. And um, I'd much rather mix a record or hear a record with someone that really was really, really good with their gear and could get nuances out of it than somebody that just got a bunch of stuff and didn't know how to use it. And then the analog digital thing, um, that 
whatever you want to use, whatever you have, there's, there's no distinction. It's just tools that we use to, for our creativity. And I have, I use a lot of analogs sometimes. Sometimes I don't use any. But if you have some used, if you don't, don't. It's not a big deal. It, it just, it's what you have. And, and, and when I was a little kid, there were debates about Ford and Chevy and you either had to like a Ford or you like a Chevy. And that, that's the debate now. They're both cars and they both work really well. We'll see you next week.